Kings chapter number 19 is where we're going to be today. Um, hey, can you throw me my phone? I'm going to try to stay on time, so <laughs> for whatever good that will do. Um, but 1 Kings chapter number 19, been in a series, uh, and kind of for those of you who are just joining us, I know the summer is not always a great time to make something this confusing because people pop in and out, but um, for those of you who have kind of been in and out, on, we start our Wednesday night Bible studies during the summer, and so um, that kind of takes the place of what we do during the semester on Thursdays with Collegians for Christ, and so uh, this summer we did a, we are doing a topical series that we're calling the Christian Mind. Mind. And on Wednesday nights, we're kind of giving some practical advice. So um, this past Sunday or this past Wednesday, we talked about restricting depression. And one of the things that we said is that you will never be able to restrict every avenue of depression, but you can change your attitude toward depressing thoughts or toward uh, maybe depressing moments. And so when we talk about depression, one of the things that I want to be very clear about is that I understand that is a very wide spectrum. Um, it is something that you can have a depressing day. Uh, you can have a discouraging day, you can have a depressing moment or a depressing time or aspect of your life. And there's some people that there is actually a medical side of depression to where it is a depressive life. It, it is a um, depressive, r depression really is almost natural to them. And so there's a wide spectrum of that. And my goal is not to really solve either, but to give biblical principles that apply. And so as we talk about battling depression today, one of our goals on Sundays is to really just give you a look at someone in Scripture who might have struggled with this. And so we talked about anxiety and fear, uh, anxiety, stress, and worry last week uh, from Martha. And uh, that is something that I've even found myself going back to this week. And so battling depression, we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter number 19. And I love this story because I think we kind of get a good glimpse of one of the heroes of Scripture having a very human moment. Moment. Sometimes in uh, God's Word and sometimes as Christians that we're 2,000 years past uh, really the life of Jesus Christ, we're some more maybe close to four or 5,000 years past some of the people that we read about, we have a tendency to almost make heroes out of people in Scripture rather than see them as humans, okay? The people that we read about in Scripture were just like you and I. James chapter number 4 talks about that with Elijah, and it says that he was a man of like passions, which is who we're going to look at today. And so 1 Kings chapter number 19, we're going to read the first 19 verses. I hope that you can follow along with me. Here's what we're going to do. I hate to apologize for that. We're going to do that in the next service as well. You shouldn't have to apologize about reading a lot of Scripture out loud in church, but I just know the way that our human ADD mind work and we're normally like oh okay can we just read two verses and move on okay that's not what we're going to do today so here's what we're going to do we're going to read responsively all right sometimes i like to do that when we're reading a long passage so i'll read verse one you read verse two i always like to go like seven verses down and say i'll read verse three you read verse four okay we're not going to do that i'll read verse one you read verse two we're going to follow the pattern just like we do in achievement testing when we fill in the little bubbles okay so i'll read verse one what verse do you read Two. Two. I read verse 11. What verse do you read? Wow. Great job. 13. <laughs> Great job. All right. Verse number one, the Bible says this, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, this goes to show you just how true ADD is. I got through verse number one, and I almost started verse number two. Like, okay, I'm just going to keep reading, all right? So now it's my turn. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judea or Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. Do you sense any depression in verse number four? Yes. Like, 
I'm not good enough, I want to die, like we could borderline even say suicidal thoughts in verse number four. Okay, verse number five. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. Which, let's stop for just a second and recall what we talked about in Psalm 23 on Wednesday, is that even in the midst of your depressing moments, God has a way of providing for you. Elijah was at a low spot right here. He said, I want to die. And God said, well, here, let me provide you some food so that you don't. God has a way of providing for you, even in the midst of dark and depressing moments. Verse number seven. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights, and And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I am very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only have left, and they seek my life to take away. Do you think he had some talking points developed? He said the same thing in verse number 10 and verse number 14. Two people say, the angel says, what doest thou hear? And then the, word of the, then the voice of the Lord says, what doest thou hear? Both times he gives the same answer. And the Lord said unto him, go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, <laughs> Matt just coughed. He was like, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> He's like, nope, if I get to, when I get to that word, I'm going to come up with a cough, all right? And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Let's stop for right there. There is so much in this passage, so many different directions that we can go, but here's what I think you'll find is that God really gives us a framework, a couple things to look through as we seek to battle depression. And so that's what I want us to focus on for the rest of our time together. Let's pray. We'll ask God to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your work. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that does not just promise us good, that does not just promise to be with us in happy and joyful moments, but you are such a good God that you show yourself strong in even our darkest moments. And Lord, it is our job as human beings and as disciples and as Christians who follow you to step back in those moments and to trace your hand, to trust who you are, and to look for you so that we may go on and have an impact. In your name we pray. Amen. 
Um, obviously, depression is something that seems to be coming to the top in our society. Really, the whole point of this series, The Christian Mind, is so that we can take some of the things that have really started to creep up in society and look at them through the lens of Scripture. I think so many times we look at something like depression or we look at something like mental health and we just say, well, that's the world diagnosing something and I don't really know how to handle it. But long before the world ever diagnosed mental health and long before the world ever diagnosed depression, depression or anxiety or any of these things that we're experiencing that are really becoming too common and too and so cultural God gave us wisdom and gave us principles that we could apply to our hearts and to our lives and in this passage and in this story what you find is that God actually is the one who pulls Elijah out of this cave and so you have a main idea there in your thought or there in your notes that I want you to maybe look at um, that you can kind of go back to and I tr I've tried to start maybe giving these so that you have something to get back to but it says this that depression is a cave that leads me to loneliness and then distracts me from the mission of God or something to that effect okay I'm not going to go back and read it right off my notes but depression is a cave meaning this that at some point in our life maybe even if it's just during a day's time we can dig into this lonely spot and get down on ourselves, get down on others around us, and it can almost get it can almost get lonely. It can almost get isolating. And sometimes that happens in the course of our day. Sometimes it almost feels like life in general is that. But the thing that I want you to see is this, is that God has the power to pull you out of that. There's a certain phrase, and I want you actually to see it because I think it's that important. There's a certain phrase in verse number seven that says this. It says at the end of the verse, it says, arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. God basically doesn't give Elijah an option to stay in depression. He says, I don't want you to stay where you're at. I've still got something more for you to accomplish. And in your dark times and in your depressing times, and maybe even, and I don't know who I'm talking to in this room, but maybe even in your suicidal times, okay? I want you to listen to this. It is important for you to realize that if you still have breath in your lungs, God still has something for you to do. If you still are living and breathing on this side of heaven, God still has something for you to do. Which means this, that suicide or depression or going into that cave and isolating yourself is ultimately pulling yourself away into a lonely, isolated spot that could bring you to a place to where you do not fulfill that which God has you to fulfill. And Elijah still had something that God wanted him to do. And so we're going to look at just really four quick thoughts about battling depression. The first one is this. The first one is this, is learn to talk to God. So how do we battle this depression? How do we get out of this cave? Learn to talk to God. Now you say, okay, I know how to pray. I pray for my meal. I prayed for my sausage casserole before I ate it this morning, okay? I, bless, I asked God for my coffee before my heat, feet hit the floor this morning. I said, Lord, give me a good day. All of that is prayer, okay? We've tried to make a distinction several times in this class that there is a difference between prayer and supplication. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is sometimes even spending time with God. But supplication is asking God. It is wanting something from God. And in this passage, here's what you see three times. Is that three times Elijah finds a way to communicate his life and where he feels like he's at to God. Sometimes we are so good at praying Sunday school prayers rather than praying real prayers. If I asked you to stand up and pray and ask, ask the Lord to bless the class, if I asked you to, to come up and pray for the prayer request, most of you would stand up and you would say something to this effect. You, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, thank you for this. Pray that you please bless us. That's our Sunday school prayer. And sometimes in our quiet and private moments with God, we pray Sunday school prayers, we pray church prayers, rather than praying real authentic prayers. And isn't it humorous that we do that to the God who knows everything about us? That we aren't honest with God about where we're actually at. That we tell God, God, I need you to do this, or God, please help so-and-so's grandma, and please, and all the while struggling internally maybe with where, where we're at. And Elijah doesn't really hold back here. 
He says, Lord, this is where I'm at. He says, what doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah says, oh, just passing through, God. Like, this is just kind of the next phase of the journey. He says, nope, God, this, your country's in a mess. Your people are killing people. God, this is, I'm the only one left. Everybody's bowing to Baal. Everyone's doing this. He gets very honest with God. And the first thing that we're going to have to do if we're going to overcome or battle any sort of depression in our life is this. We're going to have to learn to talk to God. We're going to have to learn to be honest and tell Him where we're at. We're going to have to be honest enough to say, Lord, this is my pain point. Lord, this is where my pressure is coming from. Lord, this is where my stress is coming from. Lord, this is where I need your help. So first of all is learn to talk to God. But then secondly is look for the lies. Look for the lies. I want you to look at verse number 10. He says this, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thine covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Does anybody know what happened in 1 Kings chapter number 18? Anybody know? Maybe flip over and read the little title at the top. Okay? Talk to me. I want to. I want to. I want you to learn something out of scripture. Okay. What happened in First Kings chapter number eighteen? Face off with the prophets of Baal. Okay. Someone talk to me about what was Elijah's role in that. He killed a bunch of people. Okay. Sometimes we forget that. Okay. Elijah had such a power from God that he says, you guys call down fire from your God on your altar, and I'll call down fire from my God on my altar, and we'll see whose God answers. And whoever's God doesn't answer gets killed. Okay? That's kind of a heavy, like, that's heavy pressure, right? That's not a time where you want a weak prayer life. Right? So that's, that's the moment that he's coming off of. It's not really like a small spiritual victory. Elijah, if you'll remember, he soaks his altar with water. He has them bring in water and he soaks it and then God still brings down fire. And the result is that Elijah takes the sword and slays 400 prophets of Baal. Yet what does he say in verse number 10? I want you to see this. He says, And slain thy prophets with the sword. Were the 400 prophets of Baal God's prophets or were they Baal's prophets? Elijah himself just said that this was a lie. And so here's what you have to understand. Is that many times your depression or your anxiety or your fear or your stress or whatever you want to characterize it as is sometimes rooted in a lie that is not true. It oftentimes finds its roots and its foundations in something that is not true. Elijah, basically, in this, in this verse, he over-dramatizes what he's experiencing. He says, they're killing everybody out there, God, right after he's responsible for 400 heads rolling through Israel. They're killing everybody. There's no one left to worship you. They're taking down their, your altars. They're doing this. Some of that is true. But he's now over-dramatized it, completely forgetting, and here's what I want you to see, completely forgetting what God had just used him to do. If you believe a lie long enough, it will become the truth to you. If you believe a lie long enough, it will become the truth to you. And rather than finding the truth, we so often are good at finding the lies that paint a picture of a life that we want to live. Well, I want to be discouraged about it. I want to be stressed out about this. Isn't it funny that sometimes you, you find a freshman or something, maybe when you went to college, man, they just come in, they're gung-ho. And you know who teaches them to be stressed about college? The juniors and seniors, right? Right? A freshman normally comes in like, man, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden they meet a junior and they're like, this is terrible. You need to take this seriously. This is bad, okay? And they're like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. Like my whole life is on the line. Now all of a sudden they are stressed, not because it was natural, but because it was passed down to them. Now they, well, it's, it's kind of not cool to be happy in class. It's kind of not cool to like think this is fun. So I guess I got to be stressed like everybody else. 
How many of you have ever met someone that their, their stress almost feels fake? Like, they, like their, uh, their paper is already written. Like if everybody else in the class is like stressing out about a paper, okay? Their paper is already written and they're like, oh yeah, that, it's bad, yeah. And theirs is like, they've already gone through and proofread it five times. It's like, oh shut up, Karen. Like, <laughs> you've got it already figured it out, okay? Their stress almost feels fake. And in this moment, here's what I want you to see is that Elijah basically painted a picture to an omniscient God to say, this is what I feel in this moment. It doesn't matter if it's a lie. This is what I feel in this moment. But here's what I want you to see what God's response is. God never takes those two verses and says, wrong! As Elijah's pouring his heart out and he says, no, they're killing the prophets with the sword. God doesn't buzz a beeper beep a buzzer. I don't know how that works, all right? He doesn't go, that's wrong, Elijah. That's not, that's not true. He lets him share his heart. He lets him tell what he's, what he's feeling. And then he responds with verse number 15, or verse number uh, 12. It says this, And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small Voice. If I can give you this one statement and then potentially apply it and move on, it's this. Stop looking for God and everything great and start chasing His voice. Stop looking for God and everything great and start chasing His voice. You know what is so difficult in today's society is this, especially for the generation that I'm talking to in this room. We are really good at finding things that we may think are godly rather than finding God. And I want to explain that to you, okay? We're good at chasing things that we think are godly rather than finding God. Let me ask you this. Is it easier to follow an Instagram account with pretty frilly Bible verses and cute little quotes that make you feel good that you can double tap and put the little praise hands in the comments, okay, or praying hands in the comments. Is it easier to do that or to say, God, I need you to answer this prayer in my life? Nothing wrong with the Instagram account, okay? I'm not saying that. But is it easier to do that than it is to say, God, this is where I need to hear from you? You see, sometimes we are guilty of just chasing that which is godly. And once again, I'm not trying to downgrade that. I think that's better than chasing something that's worldly and carnal. But sometimes we are guilty of chasing that more than just saying, God, if you took Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and my devotional app and my group of friends, if you took all that away from me, I would still have you. Job followed God without any of those things. Job followed God when his own friends and family said, you need to stop following God. And there comes a point in our Christian life to where all of the outside noise, all of the fire and the earthquake and the, and the, and the boom and the shock of everything. Oh man, I'm going to chase after this person's a popular Christian author. I'm going to follow them. Oh, this person's got a really cool Instagram account. This person does this, this person. All of a sudden it comes down to where we have to say, God, I need you and you alone. So not only should we look not only should we learn, not only should we listen, but lastly is this, is look for others, or if you want to even say it like this, look for blessings. Look for blessings, or look for others. Would you skip down with me to verse number 17? Actually, take that, I take that back. Verse number 18. Jesus, or God responds... In verse number 18, he says, Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. We refer to this as the remnant. Okay, So he kind of disputes Elijah's claim that there's no one left. He says, I've got 7,000. But then he says this in verse number 19, So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, 
who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. The truth is, is that the Christian life can and should be able to be lived on an island. But it doesn't have to be. The Christian life can and should be able to be lived on an island. If you put someone on the middle of an island and they had their Bible and their prayer life, they should be able to communicate with God and they could probably have a national revival on that little deserted island, okay? But it doesn't have to be lived that way. And here's the thing, and here's what I find so interesting about this truth that God gives, at least in regards to depression, is that I think God knew Elijah, if he would have just said, all right, Elijah, get up, get out of that cave, get going. We've still got work to do. We've still got something else that we, want, that we need to accomplish. We've still got this. It's all right. Everybody, you're right. Everybody's bad. Everybody's getting killed. Everything's awful. Stinks, stinks right now, okay? I think that Elijah would have been, oh, no, I'm never coming out of the cave, right? But here's what you see, is that what got him out of the cave was the idea and the truth that he was not alone. What got Elijah back up on his feet was the principle and the truth that there were others around him who were trying to follow God. So much so that when he walks out of that cave, not only does he have 7,000, but he goes and he finds one of those 7,000 to start saying, I'm going to bring you along with me. I like you. You're going to, I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to disciple you. And you want to know one of the greatest ways to get your eyes off your own problems and your own misery is to enter into someone else's misery and someone else's growth. Do you want to know one, sometimes why I think we think life is bad? Is because we don't know about anyone else's life. Unless it's social media and no one's really posting their losses on social media last time I checked, okay? We're so good at comparing our car to someone else's car that it automatically leads to this awful thought. But we never think about the person who's stranded on the side of the road who has an awful day every single day they go to work, the person who can't pay to put their gas in their car, the person who can't afford to do this. We never think about the person on the other side of that coin. And so one of the reasons why we're so good at diagnosing that our life is bad is because we never enter into someone else's life and realize that theirs is maybe also bad that they're trying to serve God out of a hard time, that they're trying to focus on God in the midst of suffering, that they're trying to follow God and learn from others. And so the best thing that we can do outside of looking, uh, or sorry, let me get back to my points, outside of learning to talk to God, outside of looking for the lies and listening to God's voice, is go and find someone else that we can walk through this life with. To where we can say, you know what, maybe my life is not as bad as what I think it is. And so here's what I want to just close with and say. I realize that this topic is very sensitive, okay? I realize that 1 Kings chapter number 19 is a very sensitive passage, okay? When you talk about suicide, there is nothing that is light about it. When you talk about depression, there is nothing that is light about it. And I understand that Christians, sometimes we have a way of just kind of saying like, hey, here you go, here's the Bible, figure it out, okay? My goal with this series, once again, is not to solve the problem, but to simply give you some biblical principles that you can start with. There may be someone in this room that you say, you know what, I need, I need to talk to someone. I, I need to get some help. I, I need to find some way out of this, okay? Do it. Look for others. Look for the blessings. There may be someone in this room that you say, you know what, I had, a, had kind of a depressing week. Had a discouraging week. I got some bad news. Okay, let's step back and let's, let's, let's look at that. Let's look for the lies. When you heard that bad news, did you just throw your hands up and assume God's not in control anymore? Well, oh, God's not good because I got bad news. What's the lie? Diagnose the lie. Listen for God's voice 
and look for those around you that can walk alongside you. Let's pray. We'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you.